So today we're talking about Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is quite a character. First of all, let's visit about the man some. His name means strengthened by God. And certainly he is strengthened by God because God is going to ask him to do some pretty crazy things. He's identified as the son of Buzi. There's a name for you. He's a priest living in Jerusalem during its first attack and was probably a teenager at that time. You'll remember that first attack in 605, the one that ends up taking Daniel to Babylon. So Ezekiel is alive during that time, probably in his teens. He gets caught in the second deportation with King Jehoiachin in 597. And at that time, he's probably close to 25. He settles along the river Chabar, less than 100 miles south of Babylon, with about 10,000 other exiles. And so you can see by looking at your map here, the journey that he would have made down to Tel Aviv. That's where he's going to land here by the river. The book of Ezekiel begins five years later in 593 BC when Ezekiel is 30 years old. And just kind of an interesting note, that's when priests could actually begin serving as priests. They had to wait until they were 30 and they would serve from the time they were 30 until they were 50 years of age. And we see this back in Numbers chapter 4 verse 3. Moses is doing a census of the Levites and he's counting the priests as those who are between the ages of 30 and 50. So Ezekiel has reached that place. He is now 30 years of, old, uh, of age and ready to take his place as a priest for the exiled Israelites. So he's not even getting to be a priest back in his hometown. Uh, he's certainly not a priest back in uh, uh, the temple. Okay, The temple's nearing its destruction. He's over in Babylon, in Tel Aviv, sharing and, and prophesying and, and trying to convince people of the need to continue to worship God, even though they're in a different location. He has a decent life in Babylon, actually. If we look in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell upon me there. And so we see by the fact that there are other leaders, elders from Judah that are sitting in his house, that he truly is a man who's respected. We also learn in this book that he has a wife that he loves dearly and she loves him. They have a great marriage. And that's going to lead to a little bit of a sad story in the book of Ezekiel. His ministry is going to last about 22 to 23 years from 593 B.C. to 571 B.C. So something that makes Ezekiel very interesting is that he's going to live through all three deportations and the destruction of Jerusalem. He's going to, to hear it all and see some of it through visions. But remember, he's experiencing it from Tel Aviv. He's experiencing it from uh, a few miles south of Babylon. He suffers some opposition in his book, and he shares about that with us, and his wife does die. So just preparing you for that moment. Ezekiel is not directly quoted in the New Testament, but many elements of his visions also appear in the book of Revelations, uh, where you see visions of God. Sometimes they seem overwhelming, almost scary. Some of those appearances, some of those images actually come from Ezekiel, especially the one of a river that flows from the presence of God. We see that as a reoccurring theme in the book of Ezekiel. So you have to stop for a moment and just think, what would it be like to be an Israelite living in Tel Aviv? Okay, you know that people are still back home in Jerusalem. There are still people who have not been deported. This is before the fall of the temple, that 586, 87 uh, BC destruction. So there are people back home, but you were one that was taken to a foreign land. Uh, we have received those encouraging words from Jeremiah that tells us, bloom where you're planted, build your houses, live a good life here, settle in, you're going to be here for 70 years. So we do have a little bit of hope that we're going to get to return at some point. But for especially the older generation, you have to be thinking there they're predicting that they're going to die right here in a foreign land. So with that kind of backdrop, let's look at the message of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was all about drama. Have you ever watched a good skit? Sometimes a good skit or a good drama, a good play can make a point better than, than any other form of literature. And that's exactly what 
Ezekiel uses as his primary means of communicating messages. He's going to do a lot of what I call street drama. He's just going to go out in the public square and, and act these images out. So just like with Jeremiah, we had 10 object lessons and five confessions. With Ezekiel, we're going to see four visions from God. He's going to see four uh, dreams or visions from God, and then a whole lot of street drama. Probably wouldn't cover about 10 of them. All right, so let's begin with the first vision that God gives to Ezekiel while he's there in the land of uh, Babylon, just south of Babylon and Tel Aviv. The first vision he receives is a whirlwind coming from the north. And in it, there are these four living creatures with four faces. So each creature has the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. And these images are flying with four wings. We also read about wheels within wheels, and these wheels are full of eyes. There's a likeness of a throne, and there's appearance of a man. And all of this together, as frightening and terrifying as it sounds, represents the glory of God. So God gave Ezekiel an awesome vision of these four-faced angels and two sets of wings to basically confirm Ezekiel's call. God then commands him to eat the scroll that is handed to him. And it contains words of lament and mourning and woe. And yet when Ezekiel eats them, they taste sweet to him. He says they tasted as sweet as honey. And it's just because uh, he's accepted and embraced the call that God, God has given him. God then told Ezekiel to go speak to the Israelites, whether they listened or not. He doesn't promise Ezekiel that his message will be received. He just says, you are to obey. You go and you talk to them, whether they accept it or not. So Ezekiel sits down by the river with the captives, and he's astonished for about seven days. He just sits there. And then finally, he begins to speak. For the next seven years, he will only speak to deliver a message from God. There's no chit chat with Ezekiel. No, how's the weather? How's it going? How's the family? He will only speak those things which relate to Israel and Israel's relationship with God. Okay, when the day that Jerusalem actually falls, this will happen later in chapter 24, verse 27, then Ezekiel is no longer mute and he's mute and he's able to talk once again about other things. But for seven years, it's all about his message from God. This is where we're introduced to his first street drama. So God tells Ezekiel to build a model of Jerusalem on a clay tablet and to set up a siege around it. It makes me have flashbacks when my son was a child and he would set up all of his little army men for a big battle, right? So that's kind of what we have going on here. Ezekiel's out in the public. He's uh, in the street. He's building a model of Jerusalem on the clay tablet, and then he sets up little men around it. He lies on his left side for 390 days, and then he switches over to his right side, and he lies on it for 40 days. God tells him that he can only prepare specific foods, and God actually tells him to prepare them over human dung. And poor old Ezekiel, he's like, no, Lord, please, please, not human dung. And so God says, okay, you can use cow dung. And so you can kind of see down here uh, the, the fire that will cook his food. Now, he's on what's called a siege diet. So during a siege, we don't have a lot to eat, right? So he's able to eat less than a quart or drink less than a quart of water and eat an eight ounce piece of bread per day. That's basically all he can have for these, uh, what would that be, 430 days that he lies in the street. The siege Ezekiel is predicting lasted two years, and he's prophesying about it before the destruction of Jerusalem in 587. So he's saying Nebuchadnezzar is going to go to Jerusalem and lay siege to it, and sure enough he does uh, for in 587, taking the Jerusalem, the city. The next street drama that we see is Ezekiel is told by God to shave his head and his beard. And of course, in that particular culture, it would have been a sign of intense mourning, right? So he's to take his, shave his head and his beard. He's to weigh the hair that he collects and he's divided into three groups. And then he's to put them on a scale and weigh them. Now the scales themselves represent judgment. Then he's to take a third of that hair and burn it in the midst of the city. He's to take a third of it and cut it up with a sword. And then he's to take a third of it 
uh, just a small number and tuck it in the hem of his garment. So think about, you know, you've got your long, your, your, your toga on, your long uh, dress like garment. And he's to take the hem, put the uh, hair inside it and then sew it back up. Okay. And just a little bit of it and then scatter the rest to the wind. And so this becomes God's interpretation of that vision. He says, Ezekiel, a third of the people, when the siege takes place, a third of the people shall die of pestilence and famine. A third shall die by the sword and a third shall be scattered with just a remnant surviving. And that's exactly what happens when Jerusalem falls. The next street drama is a, a, a little bit strange. God tells Ezekiel to go out and to preach to the mountains, not to a specific people group, but just to turn to the mountains and began preaching. And what he's supposed to tell the mountains is that there is a coming sword and the Israelite bones will be scattered all over them. So he's, he's pronouncing this destruction of, of the Israelites, but he's announcing it to the mountains themselves. Ezekiel is then told by God to throw a temper tantrum in the streets. God says, pound your fists, stamp your feet. And this is to symbolize God's fury that will be unleashed through the destruction of Jerusalem. This leads us to the second vision that Ezekiel received. And in this particular vision, Ezekiel sees the temple in Jerusalem. Now remember, he's south of Babylon. Okay, so he's seeing a vision of Jerusalem. And he sees the temple there. And God's glory from his first vision is sort of hovering above it. And then God tells Ezekiel to dig into the wall of the temple and see what's going on inside. So in, in his vision, Ezekiel digs under the temple wall. He looks inside and he sees elders acting in disobedience. He sees women crying over Babylonian idols. He sees 25 men between the porch and the altar, worshiping a sun god. So Ezekiel watches as an angel of the Lord goes through all of these people, and he marks the foreheads of Israelites who are embarrassed by such behavior. There are still some Israelites who are clinging to Jehovah God, and so their foreheads are marked. Then another angel and other angels begin to kill those who are unmarked. The angel who earlier marked the foreheads now takes fire from the temple. Okay, and this is and, and burns the temple. This is exactly what happens in 586 87. The four creatures, the wheels, the radiant figure, this, this image of the glory of God that's been hovering above the temple, then rises up and leaves the temple and the city of Jerusalem. And God tells Ezekiel to prophesy over destitute Jerusalem that God will be a little sanctuary for the Israelites in the countries where they have gone. And so the idea here is that the presence of God has moved from that temple. But the good news is, is that, that he will still be with the remnant. He will still be with those who have been scattered abroad wherever they are. Still, uh, still communicating with them through the prophets, through the priests, still being involved in their lives with the intent to bring them back with a new heart and with a new spirit. God then instructs Ezekiel to share this vision with the captives in Babylon. And so it should have been an encouraging message as they hear that God is with them, even there in Babylon. Then Ezekiel jumps into another street drama. God tells Ezekiel to pack his belongings and dig a hole under the city wall right there in Babylon, in Tel Aviv. He says, dig under the wall with your hand, no less, no shovels. He's digging with his hand and he's supposed to come out on the other side. When he does this, he's also supposed to cover his face so that he cannot see the ground. All right, what on earth does this mean? Well, God is predicting the fall of Jerusalem. And he's specifically alluding to the, uh, the attempt that Zedekiah will make to escape from the city. Remember Zedekiah, he's going to be the last king of the south. Remember how he tries to make an escape when Nebuchadnezzar comes in through the city. And so this is supposed to represent that Zedekiah's attempt to escape. The covering of Ezekiel's face symbolizes Ezekiel's blindness. You'll remember that, uh, I mean, not Ezekiel, Zedekiah's blindness. You'll remember that. Nebuchadnezzar has Zedekiah's eyes put out. And so the fact that Ezekiel has his eyes covered is to represent Zedekiah's blindness that will be inflicted by Nebuchadnezzar. 
Ezekiel was to eat his bread and drink his water with trembling and anxiety, representing the impending destruction. Back in Jerusalem, prophets were saying, the days are prolonged and every vision fails. And Ezekiel was to warn them, "Mm -mm -mm, the days are at hand and the fulfillment of every vision. So Ezekiel is supposed to counteract what's being said back in Jerusalem, reminding people that no, the, the city is going down and it's going down soon. God is basically trying to make a, a, a point here. He adopted Israel when it was an orphan child and, and it was left to die in its own blood. And God took it and he grew it in beauty. And But Israel turned away from him and became a harlot with Egypt, with Assyria, and then even with Babylon. It was a strange harlotry because usually in harlotry, what, the people pay the prostitute, right? But in this case, Israel is actually paying to have affairs with these nations in the form of tribute. Again, think bugs life. So they're paying for their to, to, to stay alive, right? They've kind of subjugated themselves to these other nations. Now those nations are abusing her, but God will take her back. And we're told in chapter 16, verse 63, that he will provide an atonement for all that she has done. Another interesting riddle that comes along about the time of this street drama is about an eagle who drops a seed that becomes a neat vine. But then another eagle comes along and the vine bends toward that eagle. God says this is what Israel did. He dropped the seed. He planted Israel. Israel grew. But then it bent first toward Babylon. And, uh, and then Zedekiah decided, no, no, I don't want Babylon. I'm going to bend toward Egypt. And of course, this would be his downfall. But God says he will plant another vine in chapter 17, verses 22 through 24, which becomes a prophecy, a messianic prophecy of a coming savior. Then we move into the next street drama. So in this particular drama, God tells Ezekiel to mark two paths. One is a road to Rabbah, the capital of Ammon. And the other is marking the road to Jerusalem. And so what Ezekiel says is going to happen is that Nebuchadnezzar will come here to this this crossroads and he will cast lots and he will choose to lay siege to Jerusalem. And that's exactly what happens in chapter 21. He does say, however, that Ammon is not off the hook. After Ammon's going to laugh when Jerusalem goes down. They're going to think it's funny that Nebuchadnezzar takes over Jerusalem. So then Nebuchadnezzar is going to redirect his path toward Ammon, and they would be the next to fall. Our next street drama is kind of a racy one. Uh, Ezekiel talks about two sisters, Ahola and Aholaba, and they become these infamous harlots. Right, so in his street drama, Ahola represents Samaria or the northern kingdom. And then Aholaba represents the south, Judah. And he says that both of these entities played harlotry with Egypt, with Assyria, with Babylon. And then as a result, their lovers became hateful to them. And now the sisters become naked and bare. I thought this would be a better image than of the end of the story, right? Okay, so on the very day that Nebuchadnezzar uh, starts his siege against Jerusalem, Ezekiel also tells this little parable of a pot that's filled with scum. Okay, and he's basically referring to the south, but he also mentions that there's some good meat in it. And these, this will be the remnant, the few that are still worshiping Jehovah God. In the next street drama is a sad one. This is that point that I referred to earlier. This is kind of the sad one. God tells Ezekiel that his wife is going to die. Okay, and, and again, they have an incredible marriage, a great relationship. She's very on board with his ministry. But here's what, there's the sad part. God tells him that he can mourn privately, but he cannot mourn publicly. He can't cry in public. He can't sigh in public. He can't even shave his head as a sign of mourning. He must wear regular clothes and he must eat regular food anytime he's in public. Now, this is going to cause people to ask why. You know, they're going to ask him, Ezekiel, are you not mourning? Are you not sad over the loss of your wife? And when people ask this, Ezekiel is to tell them that they must do the same thing when news comes that Jerusalem has fallen. It's to be symbolic of how apathetic the people have become concerning the things that are most important to God. 
And then he goes into a little section of doom. He's supposed to go out in the public square and he's to set his face. He's supposed to just turn and set his face toward Ammon and pronounce woes upon Ammon. Then turn toward Moab, pronounce mo woes upon Moab, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, Egypt, Mount Seir, which is Edom. He's supposed to turn facing each of these nations and pronounce uh, woes upon them because uh, there's for a, a time Babylon will become an instrument of judgment for all of these nations. In this particular street drama, God tells Ezekiel, he says, you are like a watchman. Now, a watchman was somebody who's a stand on the tower and to watch and to warn, right? That's the role. And this has been Ezekiel's calling. He's supposed to dispel the delusion that Jerusalem was impenetrable. And that's exactly what the people back home thought. They're like, we are God's chosen people. There's no way he will let this city fall. There's no way he will let his temple fall. And Ezekiel is the one, he's the watchman to warn and say, uh-uh, it's coming. I see it. I see it. The destruction is coming. He's to help the exiles, the people who are there with him. He's to help them understand why this has happened. It's happened because we have turned our back on Jehovah God. It was warned. We were warned of this way back with, with Moses. We knew we had a choice there at Gerizim and uh, Ebal. We had to make a choice. We could either follow God or we could reject him. There's rewards for following him and there's consequences for disobedience. So he then is to encourage the exiles, return to God. It's not too late. He's still at work in this situation. And he's to remind them that God still has a future for Israel and for all the nations. After all, Jeremiah prophesied 70 years, 70 years. And so he's telling these people, hang in here. God is going to do something. He also delivers a very specific woe for the shepherds who have fed themselves rather than their flocks. He says, God's going to hold you to a high standard. And then he also predicts a time of theocracy where God again will become the shepherd of his people. That rather than a world power in place, that God himself will rule his people. Jesus later, this is very interesting because tears Jesus later refers to himself as the head of that theocracy, the good shepherd. Now Ezekiel receives his third vision, and this is perhaps his most popular one. This is where we hear songs, we hear sermons that are focused on this particular vision. God tells Ezekiel that he's going to bring Israel back and give them a new heart and put a new spirit within them. So as a visual aid, he shows Ezekiel. He, see, he, put, he picks him up, whisks him away, sits him down in a valley full of very many, very dry bones, a lot of skeletons, right? A lot of bones. And God asks Ezekiel, he says, can these bones live? Ezekiel's, I love his response. He's kind of like, um, you know, all right. Kind of like, I, I don't know if they can or not, but you know this Lord. And God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones that they will be resurrected. And so we can hear that. I just want to read this story to you. Again, you'll hear it frequently. It says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them. So now we have skeletons and they're being covered by flesh. And the skin came over them, but there was no breath in them. So now they're just bodies lying there. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. So we get a glimpse here that the Israelites are so discouraged. But God says, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and I cause you to come up from your graves and I will bring you up into the land of Israel. So Ezekiel's getting to give some pretty good news. Yeah, he's still talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, but he's also getting to tell about Israel making a comeback. God will do this just like God brought these bones back to life. He will do this for Israel. So even though they seem without hope, he will resurrect them and their nations. 
we move into the next street drama, and God tells Ezekiel to take two sticks. So on one stick, he's to write, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. And that's representing the northern tribes. On the second stick, he's to write for Judah, representing the southern tribes. And then he's to stand there and hold these two sticks in his hand. And it's symbolic that even though the kingdom has been divided, that it will never be divided again. So north and south, it will never be divided again. Israel has become one again. Now they're exiled. They're scattered all over the place but they will become one again, never to be divided again. Again, good news. Ezekiel's going to give a little more good news than some of the other prophets that we've talked about. Hmm. Ezekiel then finishes book with a fourth vision, his fourth and final vision. So on the very day that Jerusalem is captured, back in Jerusalem, all chaos has broke out. Okay, Ezekiel is taken there in a vision. And he's allowed to observe from a high mountain and he watches as a bronze man takes measurements of the city. As he watches, the glory of the Lord from earlier visions fills the temple. There's water flowing from under the door of the temple toward the east. And then when it reaches the sea, it becomes clear water. It's healed and everything that comes into contact with the river will live. So the land is healed. It creates this new utopia, sort of a Garden of Eden again. The future blessing on the Dead Sea region is also echoed by other prophets, such as Isaiah and Joel. And that's exactly what Ezekiel is saying here. He's like, it's going to be a new city, a new place. God even goes as far as to redistribute the land to 12 tribes. And then the book ends with the name of the new city. Instead of being called Jerusalem, this city is called the Lord is there. And this reverses Ezekiel 10 verses 18 through 19 when the glory of God departs. Remember where it's scattered to, to be with all of those exiles. Now it returns to be in this place called the Lord is there. So that's the book of Ezekiel. It, it begins with the sharing of these visions and his street drama from a foreign land. Uh, it may seem a little bizarre at times, but, and it, it is a book of judgment. It's still predicting the fall of Jerusalem, but it's also an incredible book of hope promising these Israelites that someday they will return and the city will be bigger and better than ever.